Let's take a look at one more example of a scattering experiment. This is called Lao scattering or X-ray crystallography. The idea is that you uh, are sending in some X-rays that are in sync. This is a lot like the double slit experiment, except instead of uh, the light passing through two slits and interfering, you've actually got a solid with all of these atoms in them. And so as the radiation comes in, it's going to interact with those atoms that are going to re-radiate the light at these different angles, kind of like what we saw in Compton scattering. Um, but the difference here is you want to think of these uh, these atoms as being arranged in different planes. So for example, imagine you kind of connect the dots this way and you make these planes of atoms here. Well then the x-rays are going to come in, they're going to interact with the atoms and based on the angle they come in with respect to those planes, they're going to then reflect off at the same angle coming out. Here's the catch. There's actually an infinite number of these planes that are possible. Because here I drew the planes going this way, but I could also draw the planes going this way, right? The planes aren't actually there. It's a calculational convenience that we introduce. Uh, I could also draw them at an angle going like this, right? Any kind of pattern where I connect the dots, I can keep repeating and I'll get those planes coming out. I could draw the planes like this, go with a slope of, 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 of one half here. Uh, there we go. So you can imagine drawing this, you know, an infinite number of ways. So for each possible plane, for each of these infinite possible planes, you're going to get a pattern of bright and dark interference spots. And so by looking at those interference patterns, you can actually tell what kind of structure the solid has inside. I just want to give a personal comment that I am really happy with this next code that I'm about to share with you. When I took modern physics, this subject of X-ray diffraction or Lao scattering or X-ray crystallography, I didn't get it because our textbook did not do a very good job explaining how it worked. And I'm sad to say that the updated version of that textbook still doesn't do a great job explaining it. But if you can visualize it, which is one of the things we're trying to do with computation in the physics curriculum, I think it makes a lot more sense. So the purpose of this uh, notebook, which is available at a link in the description below, is to walk you through this process of x-ray diffraction, which is you, you send some x-rays into a solid material, the x-rays come out with this interference pattern and you sort of reverse engineer what the x-ray pattern is telling you about the structure of the solids. So let's have a look at how this works. This notebook gives you a little bit of an introduction of, of the setup of crystal structure. So when we talk about the setup of atoms in a solid, we're talking about some kind of regularly repeating structure called a crystal lattice. There's a few simple examples here, like the, uh, the, the simple cubic, the body-centered cubic, the face-centered cubic. Most structures are some variation on those. So they might be a, a body-centered cubic with an extra atom next to each of the dots here. Um, another common example is the hexagonal close pack. So this is where you've got layers of hexagons uh, between each other and, and each layer is offset a little bit. Um, one really, my favorite example is, uh, is diamond versus graphite because diamond and graphite, so the stuff we put in jewelry on the stuff we put in pencils, they're made of the same stuff. They're both made of carbon. Uh, the difference is how those carbon atoms are arranged. So what we're going to look at is how do you specify that crystal structure? What do you have to tell the computer in order to model that crystal structure? Well, the, the basic elements that you need are three lengths and three angles. So to, to create a very basic lattice structure, now we have to modify this to get to more of the fancy ones, but the basic lattice structure involves three side lengths and three angles. The, the edge lengths we're going to call A, B, and C. That just gives you a three-dimensional basis. They're not necessarily along X, Y, and Z because, as you can see, they're not necessarily perpendicular. They might be shifted. But you need three lengths because you're in three dimensions. You also need three angles. So if you wanted to create a cube, you would have A equals B equals C and alpha equals beta equals gamma. That would give you a cube. And as you think about modifying those, you're basically taking a cube and stretching it and twisting it and things. So, for example, graphite 
is going to have a and b equal to each other at uh, 2.46 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, a c length of about three times that long at 6.71 times 10 to the minus 10. You're going to have alpha and beta at right angles and gamma equal to 120 degrees. What we do with those three pieces of information is define vectors a, b, and c. We call these primitive vectors. They're kind of like unit vectors in that they give you the basis for your lattice, but they're not unit vectors in the sense that number one, they're not, um, they're not, they don't have a length of one and they're not obviously not necessarily perpendicular to each other. Basically, the A vector goes along this edge length, the B vector goes along this edge length, the C vector goes along this edge length. So again, think of taking your X, Y, and Z axes and just kind of morphing them along the direction and length for this unit cell. The first thing we're going to do with those primitive vectors is define what we call reciprocal vectors. We're going to use these in defining the wavelength and the direction of the incoming X-rays. Uh, basically, we're going to call these A star, B star, and C star. You can think of those as being kind of the reciprocal of A, B, and C. The way we're going to define them is A star is going to have the cross product of B and C, B star is going to have the cross product of C and A, and C star is going to have the cross product of A and B. Um, basically, whatever vector is on here on the left-hand side, you're going to get the other two vectors on the right-hand side. Then we're going to divide by that cross product and dot it with the uh, the vector on the left side. So this is a dot b cross c, b dot c cross a, c dot a cross b. The order there is very important. It's always going to be a cyclic permutation of alphabetical order. And there's a neat property these have that the reciprocal vectors are going to be perpendicular with the original vector. So a star dot b and a star dot c are going to be zero even though a, b, and c don't have to be perpendicular to each other to begin with. The next thing we're going to do, you might remember on the board we had these atoms arranged and I talked about how you can create an infinite number of planes from the atoms here. So for example, you might have planes going this way, you might have planes going this way, you might have planes going at this angle, you might have planes going at this angle, you might have planes going at this angle, you might, you can have any of these angles, right, as long as they're passing through, uh, you know, multiple atoms there. The way we define those planes is with their normal vector. So think about taking each of these planes and drawing a vector that is normal to them or perpendicular to them. Those are actually given in terms of the reciprocal lattice vectors, right? Because these are perpendicular. So these, uh, these A star, B star, C star are perpendicular to the original A, B, and C. So we're going to call those vectors n hat. We're going to build them out of the A star, B star, and C star using these integers H, K, and L. We call those the Miller indices. And basically the way you denote one of these planes is just by its Miller indices, H, K, L. So when you see this trio of numbers, H, K, L, that's going to tell you the normal vector to that particular plane that we're working with. <clears throat> So finally, we can get down to this D, this distance between the, uh, the planes that we've drawn. That's going to depend on the Miller indices, right? You might have one distance when you're stacking the planes like this, but as you rotate those planes, the distance is going to change. And the distance actually ends up being this nice, complicated thing. This is not something you need to memorize. It's not something that you need to be able to derive. It's something that we're going to put in the computer and have the computer calculate. Basically, we provide the alpha, beta, gamma, and the a, b, and c, and the computer will use this to calculate the d here. This is the d that appears in the x-ray diffraction condition, and this is the thing I never understood when I was taking modern physics. It was only when I went to make this code that I finally understood what this distance d is. It's the distance between those two planes that depends on your Miller indices h, k, and l. So Python can calculate this for us. I'll ask you to walk through a couple of sample calculations there for it. But finally, come down here to the code. What you're going to do is specify those six lattice parameters. You need alpha, beta, gamma, and a, b, and c. Notice we've got 90, 90, 90, and equal a, b, and c values. This is going to give us a cube to start out with. We're going to convert the degrees into radians because Python requires radians. We're going to calculate our primitive vectors. 
uh, a vector, v vector, c vector, and then we're going to calculate the reciprocals a star, b star, c star using that equation that we had above. Next, what we're going to do, we're going to set up a couple of lists. So remember, the goal here is to look at the interference pattern, meaning the bright spots on the screen that you're looking at. Each one of those bright spots is going to occur at a different x and y coordinates. So here we're just recording those coordinates. We set up a distance to that screen along the z-axis, and here we set the wavelengths of the x-rays. Uh, this should be slightly less than the distance between the planes, so I just set it to be 40% of the minimum lattice edge length there, A, B, or C. Uh, then we're going to create our incoming beam. This is going to be the direction here, so that's going to be the z-hat direction. Then we're going to define x-hat and y-hat for convenience. Then what we're going to do, we're going to start looping over the planes. Remember, there's an infinite number of these planes. We're going to be approximating infinity as 10. Uh, so we're going to look at 10 of these planes, 10 sets of Miller indices. If you want to catch more points, just increase this number. Go from 10 to 100 to 1,000. Just know that every time you increase that, the code is going to take longer. So if you double this, it's going to take eight times as long because you're going twice as long on this loop, twice as long in this loop, and twice as long on this loop. Uh, first thing we're going to do, we're going to avoid dividing by zero. It does not like that, so we're going to avoid having uh, h, k, and l all equal to zero. So we're, there is no zero, zero, zero plane, right? That would be a zero vector. So, so you can't have a zero, zero, zero Miller plane, I think. Let me know if I'm wrong about that. Here we define the normal vector. So this is the h, k, l, the Miller indices, times a star, b star, and c star. Then we're going to calculate that interplanar distance d. This is that long equation that we wanted uh, Python to calculate for us. It's so long I split it up into the numerator and the denominator. So d is equal to square root numerator over denominator. Uh, then what we're going to do, we're going to figure out what our maximum n is, right? So n in d sine theta equals n lambda, or 2d sine theta equals n lambda, excuse me. Uh, the n in this equation is which bright spot you're getting. So you'll get a, a, a first, a zeroth bright spot, first bright spot, second bright spot, etc. Um, there's a maximum on that because we can't take sine of theta past one, and so this is simply figuring out what that maximum n is in order to avoid taking the arc sine of a number bigger than one because it won't like that either. A couple of picky things to worry about in this code. Then we're going to loop over those n values. So we're going to go from zero up to that maximum value and calculate the location of the bright spot. So we're measuring this from the beam's axis. So we need to multiply by two because there's an angle theta coming in and an angle theta coming out. So if you measure it from the beam coming in, it's actually two times theta coming out. Another thing I never understood just reading about this in a textbook. Uh, so then we set up where the outcoming beam is going to be and we figure out what that uh, locations x coordinates going to be and y coordinates going to be and then after we have that list all taken care of we're going to create a scatter plot with all of those results. Finally we'll come down here and this is the result that we get. So if you do this experiment this is the pattern that you should be able to see. So a crystallographer can look at this thing and tell that it has a cubic structure. I am not a crystallographer, so I am not trained to think that way, but after you do this hundreds and hundreds of times, you look at this pattern, you say, yes, that has a cubic structure. You can tell that, I think, because it's, it's the same pattern going this way and this way, and it's got this nice regular pattern along the diagonal there. I'm sure a crystallographer will correct me in the comments on that. But this is what you do is you, you would then make changes to your crystal setup. Let's suppose we stretch this thing in the A direction. Let's suppose we make it twice as long in the A direction. So you're no longer looking at a cube. We're looking at a rectangular prism that is twice as wide as it is tall. And you notice that squishes the pattern here. So it squishes it along the x direction here basically and gives you a different pattern along the x than it has along the y. That's your Q that there is something different about the x direction than there is about the y direction. And basically what you would do, you could reverse engineer this. So you could play around with the a, b, c, alpha, beta, gamma values until you get a pattern on here that matches the pattern from your crystallography experiment. Uh, let's try one more. Let's try changing up the angles a little bit. So let's suppose that our gamma, uh, let's suppose that, that vertical axis there instead of being 90 is going to be squished down to 45 degrees. Uh, so let's see, so remember what our default looks like. Oh, so you see here we get a little bit of an angle here, so you can measure that angle. 
reverse engineer that to the 45 degree angle. So this is how you can tell what stuff is made of. And what I like about this code, it's letting you do crystallography experiments, but you're getting to fine tune what the crystal structure is and you're getting out the diffraction pattern here. So there's a lot you can play around with on this code. You can change the lattice structure. You can change the incoming wavelength. You can change the distance to the screen. Um, I hope that's useful to you in uh, elucidating this kind of dense topic.